right, uh, welcome to today's uh, 1140 talk. Uh, my name is Ted Normanton from the Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity and Program Chair for next year. Um, I want to remind you that the TLP for this is white or under the new system, TLP clear. Uh, there will be time for questions and answers at the end with microphones at the front and in the centre of the, uh, the corridor here. Uh, do not forget to do the survey at the end of this. Uh, so we really need that information for, for future program, programming. And if you have not already, please silence your devices. And without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Sharif Hashem from George Mason University, who's one of the few board members that I did not infect with COVID uh, earlier this year. <laughs> All right, Sharif. Thank you. It's my pleasure being here with you. Uh, the first time I discussed this type of, you know, uh, bridge between the technical community and the UN and what's happening internationally when it comes to setting up norms and rules, that was 10 years ago. And while I was, it was quite lonely uh, because, I mean, we come from a technical background and you don't usually engage with, uh, you know, intergovernmental organizations unless we have to. And I had to. Uh, ten years ago, I was appointed to join one of the, uh, you know, distinguished groups at the UN, a uh, group of di diplomats working on norms, uh, developing norms. And uh, I'll give you some background about this. But I, more importantly, I, I'd like to share with you the experiences that I had uh, in the engagement, how we started off from kind of uh, separate points of view, if I may use the term, uh, then there is convergence. And, and what we reached was by consensus. And, and I've learned quite a few things while working with those groups over the years. And I really made a lot of friends there. So uh, this talk actually is a result of cooperation with uh, my dear colleague, Martin Van Hornbeck, who was not able to join us. Uh, I am actually wearing an academic hat, however, for the past 25 years, I've worked in different positions, uh, advising and implementing initiatives uh, in cybersecurity, uh, PKI, uh, digital signature, uh, working with international organizations as well as you know, regional organizations. I'm a member of the African Union Cybersecurity Expert Group. Uh, currently, I'm in the US, so I I will share with you some of the experiences that I came across uh, throughout my professional career here. Uh, cyber norms, that's a term that actually evolved over the last maybe 15, 20 years. Um, uh, and, and, you know, the, the best place to learn about this is from, you know, groups who have been developing norms for other purposes. Uh, to me, it was for ICT and ICT users. Uh, and. Uh, as it's mentioned here, the gold standard for such norms uh, lie in the UN group of governmental experts that was formed under the UN. Um, I'll give you some background on that group. Uh, actually, there are six groups of that name that over the years that were formed. Uh, also, more recently, there is another group which is very open. I'd like to draw your attention to it and uh, to share with you uh, opportunities. Uh, of engagement with those groups and with the work done. Oh, uh, UNGGE and open-ended working group. Uh, the work with UNGGE, uh, you know, starts uh, and is hosted by uh, the UN First Committee. Uh, uh, you know, from the name, it's the First Committee, and it's the committee that deal with this armament. Uh, so. Uh, to know about a little bit about the history, it, disarmament means that they worked on issues, such groups worked on issues on you know, weapons of mass destruction. And when I uh, was uh, invited, nominated to join the group in 2012-2013, uh, I realized you know, the immense pressure and that in this case, ICTs was you know, uh, seen and, uh, as, as you know, along the threat uh, you know, uh, environment uh, for international peace. So, and, and they are drawing on expertise from across the world. I was uh, among a group of 15 uh, members. Uh, I was uh, the only non-diplomat among the group. 
uh, the only one from Africa and the Middle East. And uh, if I see someone from Latin America, there was just one from Latin America. So you have, roughly speaking, about 90 countries with two representatives among 15. Uh, but anyway, uh, I worked my way through this process. Uh, I will share with you some of the outcomes, but part of the process is to engage and to discuss. As I said, I was the only non-diplomat. Uh, the groups involved a lot of expertise, diplomats, international law experts, uh, people working in national security. And actually, uh, there were like a couple of diplomats with ICT background. Uh, it's important to give you this, you know, background information uh, because in our discussions, you know, what usually uh, they start off with is text that was used to deal with weapons of mass destruction in other areas. Uh, and they try to use similar things for ICTs. And, you know, you can imagine uh, we had some uh, fundamental disagreements on some of the articles. Uh, and the point here is to engage, to understand their points of view, and to communicate uh, what I believe is, uh, you know, uh, an ICT-based point of view. And I was surprised. Uh, I've learned a lot from their points of view, and also uh, I was able to uh, negotiate and build consensus among removing some of those articles from the text altogether, so you'll not see it. Uh, and, and because it's not relevant. Uh, jurisdiction is totally different. If you're talking about kinetic attacks, you know, real physical you know, engagements, or engagement in cyberspace. Uh, if you're talking about proportionality, this is a concept that they have. So what's proportionate? If you try to uh, carry uh, you know, analogies from the physical world and to try to see what would be a proportionate attack on ICT infrastructure, uh, you, I mean, if someone attacks with a malicious software, you know, how it will propagate, will it show up? Unlike in kinetic kind of words. So we cannot really use the same text. Uh, and I've learned, you know, that, <laughs> that, that, for instance, some countries at that point in time uh, didn't, you know, appreciate and didn't, you know, understand uh, the relevance of using the term cyber as opposed to information security. Uh, fortunately, I've worked on both sides. And I made a strong point. I mean, we, we are doing cyber. We are doing, you know, you know, protection of infrastructure, protection of systems, rather than getting into data and categorization of data and protection of data. It's not. It's very important topic, but it's very elaborate. So there are overlapping areas that we need to address, and we need to, to be careful not, so as not to be drifted from the main purpose of incident responders. Um, so, among the six UNGGE uh, committees that were convened, starting from 2004 uh, up to the last one, which concluded its work in 2021, uh, uh, there are four reports, four committees reached uh, agreement by consensus. The way the process works, uh, we reach the reports by consensus, which is sometimes challenging because some committees fail to do this. Uh, then it gets sent to the Secretary General of the UN and up to the General Assembly of the UN. So the reports that you see here were finally endorsed by the full membership of the UN. So although those are uh, non again, that these are technical terms, non-binding norms, this is not a convention. However, 190-something countries agreed on you know, the applicability of those norms. So this is a great starting point for all of us. Uh, among the, the issues that I lobbied for, um, the UNGGE is governmental experts. We lobbied to expand. We, uh, at the GGE, invited, I, I was representing my home country, Egypt, at that point in time, uh, uh, and we expanded the scope by, you know, endorsing the creation of what became afterwards the open-ended working group which is open to non-governmental organizations, we're open to the private sector. And the first one was started in 2019. Actually, if you see the top uh, left corner here, I was invited in the opening sessions of the open-ended working group, uh, which was led by a distinguished Swiss diplomat uh, to talk about capacity building in cyberspace. And uh, you will see when we navigate through the text uh, that, for instance, they, they, there is a lot for us to do, a lot expected from the international community uh, to add in terms of value. Uh, 
so, so uh, that open-ended working group is open for all of us and uh, in different capacities, whether you are engaged with an NGO, engaged with a company, work for government, everybody is in. I had, you know, some professional concerns that the first UNGGE, uh, uh, I mean, recommending the open-ended working group that this will go through, it went through. I had concern whether the open-ended working group will end up with a consensus report. I'm really happy to report that this happened. And thanks to really distinguished, you know, chairmanship, but also participation from various, you know, uh, levels, government, non-government, and so on. So this is something to, I mean, that we are continuing now with another engagement, another open-ended working group was started in 2021, uh, 2020, uh, with a term up to 2025, five-year term. I strongly encourage that you engage with them. Now, the composition, as I said, uh, since we lobbied in 2012-2013 for expanding the UNGGE group, 15 members from all across the globe is not enough, it was expanded to 25 members. So the last UNGGE included four representatives from Africa, several from Latin America, and from across the world. So inclusion is really important. Many of my colleagues from Africa, from the Middle East, from uh, Latin America, contributed significantly. In addition, of course, to uh, experts and diplomats, and we, we're seeing now within that group, uh, many uh, diplomats are now with ICT background. So it's easier to dig deeper and to discuss in more you know, details what needs to happen. The open-ended working group is uh, obviously open. Uh, so to share with you the famous 11 norms that uh, were part of the report of the, uh, the, the 2015 uh, UNGGE report, uh, to give you an idea about really some, uh, you know, the implications of uh, the text uh, and, and those norms. Uh, those norms are and principles are for responsible state behavior. This is not just for government. This is for everybody. This is for the globe. This is endorsed by the UN General Assembly. It applies to all of us. And it's really, it, it represents a great starting point for us if you want to engage in the community at all levels. You'll see here some of the norms about uh, what states should do and what states should not do. Uh, so in terms of sharing knowledge, uh, working together, partnership, uh, uh, this is reflected in you know, the highlighted green text. Uh, on the other side, also what states should uh, abstain from doing and try to prevent the usage of their infrastructure in launching attacks on uh, or illicit use of ICTs. You'll see also uh, some mention of the international law, its applicability. Uh, it was difficult for me to spend like eight working days to understand the arguments where some of the members of the GGE uh, argued why should international law be applied other members didn't think that it should be relevant anyway that was settled in 2013 this is really important because i studied about international law a little bit and it's really a great base to start when it comes to regulations and we can go back to the usage of international law i strongly encourage if you are involved in enforcement enforcing you know uh, uh, measures regulations in ICT that you reach out to a legal expert in your organization to know more about you know uh, those norms how they apply how can you make use of them in you know conveying your message uh, there are different measures that are included here in, including attribution attribution in again the physical world is is kind of straightforward the humankind I mean the mankind we, we did this over years for centuries uh, However, attribution in ICT is not that obvious. We see, uh, you know, proxy actors. We see uh, a lot of uh, anonymized, you know, traffic. And uh, as such, we should act accordingly when it comes to responsibilities of states, responsibilities of, uh, you know, key actors, key stakeholders, even from the private sector. Because, I mean, we know about men in the middle attack. Uh, and we know that sometimes uh, an obvious 
uh, uh, you know, um, uh, quote unquote, enemy, uh, uh, adversary, could not be the right one. It just could be man in the middle attack. We have seen in the keynote speech at the beginning of this conference how someone was made to look like as if they are uh, the child abusers and then suddenly it became some other person. And this is individual. In terms of states, if you watch, you know, uh, uh, some of the thrillers, the James Bond movies from the 1960s, 70s, you can see easily. I mean, uh, there are groups that play around creating hostility between two countries. Uh, and and in, in empowering this or increasing the, that hostility by engaging uh, in you know uh, organization in the middle attack, uh, we need to be careful. We need to also guide uh, our organizations, our countries, to be uh, you know looking for not just the obvious enemy, but what's behind it. What are the motivations? Uh, we cannot do this. We cannot be first responders when it comes to that type of intelligence. We are not trained to do this. Uh, we might be, uh, you know, supporting whoever is doing this. And this is where, you, I mean, it's really important when it comes to implementing those norms to know where we fit, where we add value, and where we have to reach out and support others. Like today's, you know, panel about cybercrime. I've been, you know, in different, you know, forums talking about cybercrime, engaging with the Interpol, with the NATO uh, conference and, and other activities. I take a second seat. Never a first seat uh, for a simple reason. This is not my, I'm not part of law enforcement. Uh, so, so that's why when, when we focus on our role, we add value. And at the same time, this is to me is a uh, you know, fruitful partnership. Then uh, aside from the norms, so that tricky part, I mean, we have norms. You can always, anyone can think about those norms and think about, oh, well, I can come up with you know, additional norms. To me, going through the discussions, this is a lifetime achievement if we are able to implement those norms. The point is not coming up with, you know, uh, nerdy text or some, you know, attractive, you know, phrases. How to implement them? How to make this part of a country's policy or a regional policy? It, it requires a lot of changes, you know. Definitely, uh, Ned will not allow me time to talk about, about this in extensive, you know, uh, uh, form because this will take probably the rest of the day at least. Uh, lots of details. We are talking about multi-stakeholder approach, which is not a nice to have, uh, in my view, not a nice to have thing. It's an essential for the success of implementation of norms. So wh when I engage with other, you know, stakeholders, it is not a, just a, a nice privilege to have, but this is the way to go, and it is not easy. To, to work it through when it comes to implementations because we come from different backgrounds. We need to understand the language. I've made a lot of friends among diplomatic circles, from international law circles, circuits, from law enforcement circles, but you know, it took a lot of time to build trust and to have meaningful working relationship. It is well worth it, well worth the investment of energy and time to do this. Uh, in terms of norms, also to, to support the implementation of any norms that you come up with, uh, we need to have confidence and trust. Uh, I think among the few professionals who know about the value of trust and confidence is the instant responders, you, us. Uh, so we, we know that we cannot build trust and confidence during a crisis time. You know, you have an emergency, you're not, you know, uh, uh, at you know, at ease to try to build trust. It has to be done ahead of time. And our certs, our C certs, uh, incident responders across the globe, they know how to do this. First is a great forum to empower, you know, such networking across. And throughout my work with the GGE or Open Ended Working Group, the only, you know, organization or profession that was mentioned over and over again with unanimous consensus that they have a role to play as instance responders and CSORs. You'll find it's, it's in the text, several references to the role of CSORs. So this is us. So here uh, the whole international community is looking for us to support and to help. Starting from sh sharing basic information about who's who. What can we do? How can we help? Uh, what is available in terms of cap capacity building? 
how can we help other organizations? Uh, this is really very pragmatic down to earth. Uh, I can navigate through this quickly, but you see here from the confidence building measures, and I'm quoting from the UNGGE reports, they define the role for national sea certs. They define you know, significant role for regional cooperation, international cooperation. This is us, this is here, this is first. Uh, as I, I cannot overemphasize it. Uh, I've enjoyed being there and I've enjoyed really hearing about how the international community, the diplomats, the international lawyers, government representatives see us and look forward for our input. Uh, you'll see this is more recent. So uh, aside from the initial you know, norms uh, that you might have heard of in, from 2015, this is from the 2021 report. Again, uh, cooperation and regional, uh, at the regional and international level is mentioned and certs and C-certs are mentioned. Uh, in, in this regard. Not supporting, you know, uh, offensive uh, work, and this is, you know, a, a very important and sensitive topic. I've heard in some discussions uh, in one of the conferences organized by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, the OECD, uh, some of, I mean, the experts coming from a technical background defending the view of hacking back. Well, it might look cool for some to hack back. And of course, for companies that were subjected to a serious attack, they lost assets. They feel that they can do it. I definitely, personally, professionally, am against this 100%. For a very simple reason. We don't have all the information. No one has the, all the information. And there are channels to do this. There are diplomatic channels. There are you know, channels through the Interpol law enforcement, where we can, you know, pursue criminals and, and you know, uh, punish them by trying them in front of a court of law and, and you know, uh, uh, stopping them from causing harm. Never going to work if it's going to hack back, you know. So that's, again, my view. Uh, also engaging c in uh, or weaponizing c -certs. That's something which is, you know, very timely. Uh, uh, C-certs should be seen as firefighters, you know. Uh, we shouldn't be seen as part of, you know, an offensive capabilities of a country. Uh, there are many sides of it. I'm happy to discuss this, you know, again because of where I'm running out of time here. Uh, but there are reasons for us to try to stick to what our main responsibility is or responsibilities are actually, and, and to make sure that we are there to defend, you know, uh, our you know, society at, a, I mean, a national level, at, a, I mean, regional level, at a global level, to have safer cyberspace. Uh, when it comes to critical infrastructure, we have seen, you know, and throughout, you know, our experiences and discussed again in this conference how, you know, attacks on infrastructure can be very devastating for countries. We have seen the presentation from Ukraine yesterday, as, as well as, you know, prior experiences uh, in different regions. It is something that we need to focus on. And again, partnership is really important because, I mean, you have the operators. You have, uh, it's the private sector who operate most of the infrastructure across the globe. So we need to find formulas to work with them. It's quite challenging. I come from an IT background. However, I have a degree in industrial engineering. So I know really de dealing with SCADA systems and, you know, uh, uh, ICS systems and so forth is not as dealing with a computer that you can shut or reboot every now and then. They don't reboot utility power you know, controllers every now and then. This is a nightmare for them. So, so anyway, we need to be open, understand, work with them, and reach you know, uh, a formula for cooperation. You'll see again here uh, in the green text uh, about cooperation, how CSERTs are relevant. We are relevant. We are seen as relevant. Uh, confidence building measures are really important. So whenever you see this discussed, I've participated in, in the IGF discussions. I'm happy that we, we have discussions. We have at least another talk on norms and CBMs throughout the conference, uh, take you know, advantage of this and engage. Uh, I have colleagues from Brazil who engage with their you know, representatives in the UNGGE, uh, colleagues from Mauritius, actually the, the head of the Mauritius CERT 
from Africa is the representative, was, was the representative in the last UNGGE. Uh, we have the Kenyan representative who made, she made an excellent uh, participation in the, the UNGGE that produced the, the norms that we all saw. Uh, it's from all corners of the world. I think it's really important to have professionals engage with diplomats to make sure that, you know, whatever we reach in terms of text, in terms of directions, makes sense and is applicable. So, partnership. Uh, from first point of view, we try to build, you know, a common understanding, uh, set priorities, try to communicate those priorities to all the force. So, there are different, you know, uh, attempts at doing this over the years. There were informal conversations with the UNGGE groups, as well as the open-ended working group. Uh, we worked with other organizations in the civil society, professional associations, NGOs. We emphasize inclusion and partnership. This is key. This is again not uh, done necessarily for diplomatic purposes here, but it's for realistic view. We need to have this. We need to have inclusion. We need to have openness. And, and this is our only hope. Uh, uh, capacity building. This is kind of important when it comes to this relevant, but it is far more important for us to believe that capacity building is you know, our most valuable asset in fighting against you know, threats or challenges in cybersecurity. Uh, that's why, again, uh, uh, I, I highlight for first that we establish, you know, a permanent position, a full-time position uh, for a capacity building and community building, you know, director within first. Uh, we hope that we reach out to all of you and you reach out to uh, Clay, who's taking this uh, position. It's up to us to make it happen, up to us to empower all certs, all incident responders, uh, uh, P certs, C certs. Uh, even if an organization doesn't have, you know, a C-cert or a P-cert, but they have instant responders, we reach out to them. We make sure that we support them. At the high level, when it comes to decision makers, and this is sometimes quite challenging, we need also to have some sort of empowerment to decision makers to understand about the real issues, to understand about the solutions, to understand about, you know, the, the spread and the diversity of our problems. Uh, we will not get resources, we will not get support unless we do this. It's a lot of hard work, it's taking us out of our sometimes comfort zone, but this is nece necessary to do, and that's what we are doing here. Uh, yeah, uh, among our points of view, among our strength, really, as an organization, as a community, uh, we have Essex uh, uh, First uh, initiative, and, and we have this, you know, uh, uh, I mean, as a background of what we stand for, what we highlight. Uh, we also developed TLP, uh, the traffic light protocol, and we're using it efficiently in our conference, obviously. We need also in the text in governmental and international documents to talk to us using TLP. Because sometimes when they say you cannot, uh, you know, when it comes to sanctions and export control, you cannot talk about technology. Oh, well, uh, if I'm exchanging my card with my email, is that technology? Everything has technology. With IoT, technology is everywhere. So we know the more efficient way is to go through classifying information. That I know when, when it is public information, really, I mean, it's ridiculous to talk about, you know, uh, controls over something which is public, essentially. Uh, and, and that's why you know, having this type of trajectory of where we are, where we need to be, uh, is really important to set priorities. If we have TLP applied in all, you know, the text coming from, you know, various uh, regulatory, uh, you know, sanction organizations and so forth, it is something that we relate to, we understand, and we know how to apply. Cybersecurity is a shared responsibility. It is not just for uh, nerds, not just for ICT professionals, not just for instant responders. It's the responsibility for the whole community, for the, the global you know, society. Uh, everybody has a role. No one 
uh, can claim that cybersecurity does not affect them. It's around us. And moving forward, you know, with billions of devices that are linked to the internet and a lot of attack vectors uh, uh, that are being created, you know, criminals, they are full-time, as it was mentioned earlier in a couple of the keynote speeches, I mean, in the conference, they are full-time professional criminals. So they, they have the motivations, they have the resources. And I'll tell you, they, they have easy, straightforward ways of agreeing, you know, how to do their criminal activities. We cannot really underestimate this, and we cannot let, you know, some superficial differences on where we're coming from being barriers for us to reach a more effective way of cooperation and partnership. Because again, partnership is not a nice to have thing. It's our only hope, really, to have effective, you know, uh, ways of facing the challenges and the threats. So it's a shared responsibility. Everybody has a stake. Everybody has an interest. And when I say I've never been in a conference or given a talk throughout my professional life where cybersecurity was seen as not important, it is when you ask people to reach out and make decisions. You think cybersecurity is important. Can you reach out to your wallet? I need a budget for cybersecurity. That's the challenge. And sometimes I get a response. What's the return on investment? Well, if I lose an asset, if it is hardware, yeah, the cost of that hardware is, you know, the threat, you know, uh, you know, consequence. But if I lose trust, how much money we put on that? If we lose the ability of our healthcare system to function, and somebody loses their life, uh, do you put a value on this? At a, I mean, at, at a general high level, you know, uh, country uh, level uh, or continent level. I come also from Africa, so. During COVID time, without ICTs, many of our societies would not function, would not learn, education would stop, would not be able to work, do transact financially, uh, pr I, mean, pr I mean, provide healthcare. So I think now we are at a unique position where I mean, the general public appreciate the value added of ICTs, appreciate also the challenges uh, that we face. We are in together and we should look for solutions that really accommodate where we're coming from and you know, what the community is looking for us as an instant response community when it comes to supporting the international you know, safety and security and more importantly for us to play the role that we are expected to do when it comes to providing the technical and professional expertise and, you know, in, in making this happen. Uh, our views were communicated to the open-ended working group. You can look on, uh, through the slides. Openness, inclusive approaches, a multi-stakeholder approach was, was highlighted. Uh, also, we quoted from the UN GGE reports about not using C-certs for offensive uh, you know, uh, operations, also not to politicize C-certs. Uh, this is really important, again, we don't have time for it. Thank you very much. Here is you know, my contact information. Uh, so I guess we have a few minutes for question and answers. And I'm really happy to address this. I think this is you know, something that is going on. It will not go away in the coming you know, uh, decades. Discussions about cyber securities and norms. So I, I really uh, I hope that I convey the message that we need to engage. We need to support. We have a role to play. And I wish you the best. Thank you very much, Sharif. Uh, does anyone, anyone have any questions? Hi, thank you for your presentation. I wanted to touch a little bit upon the issue of attribution. Uh, I'm part of an organization, I, I work for an organization that is part of the EU public administration. And in the EU, we primarily deal with attribution as a diplomatic issue. And in the European Union, we even have the cyber security, uh, the, the cyber diplomacy toolbox, which once activated, all the relevant decision makers will come together and we, they will decide on the basis of the evidence and they will collectively agree on the issue of attribution. From a legal uh, viewpoint, this is kind of absurd because if the evidence is there, albeit difficult to, to find, to, to, to come by, but if the evidence is there and the evidence suggests that somebody has done something, 
uh, that individual or organization or state is responsible. So there's no question about that. We don't need to collectively agree on it. And then there is us who are in possession of the evidence. We are the computer emergency response team. We provide this evidence. And on the basis of this evidence, they need to uh, make up their minds. So they kind of put us in a difficult, like an, almost an impossible situation uh, in a way, I would say that on, it's, it's, it, it heavily depends on what we will provide as evidence for them to make such uh, a decision. So my question is, uh, how can we um, reach an understanding of who does what and um, how to, to, take, to take care of this um, issue, in a way? Very important okay. question. Thank you for asking this. It's, it's really important. You know, uh, at the UNGGE meetings that I attended 10 years ago, uh, I had discussions with several countries, including very advanced countries, and, and um, about attribution, I was, I mean, discussing with them. Uh, typically, what would be the you know, correct attribution percentage that you had in the past? The highest was, can you guess a number? 15%? No, it was higher than this. <laughs> it was about 60%. You're talking to diplomats at this point, so, so not talking to, uh, you know, certs. But I told them, if it is 60% in the most advanced countries, how about the developing countries? We have 190-something countries in the world. So attribution is quite you know, challenging. I'm glad that the EU is taking this collectively among the EU community, but you have a, a very right I mean, concern about you know, how much information do you, sh do you share? Because you get this in confidence and so forth. This is, you know, again, it's very hard to answer this in a couple of minutes, but this is quite challenging. I have my experience from my home country. I have my experience working with international organizations. It is very much region dependent, you know, about the legal uh, structure that governs, you know, the sea certs. I tried as much as possible to distance the certs from becoming an extension to law enforcement. With all due respect, I have a lot of friends from law enforcement. We cooperate on, I mean, uh, investigations and stuff like that, if it is at the national level, as per, you know, the agreed upon framework. But I'm not part of their day-to-day -day operation. I shouldn't. Uh, we should distance ourselves from, you know, being engaged in, you know, political, you know, type of debates and stuff like that. We are not diplomats. I understand how diplomacy works. I actually, participated in you know, cyber diplomacy workshops, but I need to know my borders. You know? So I, 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 again, I don't have an easy answer for you, but it's a process that you need to start based on you know, what's available to you in terms of the legal coverage, the legal regulations within the EU, but to make sure that you highlight you have a role to play. And if you become part of law enforcement, you will not be able to play your major role, the main activity. Thank you again for asking. We've got uh, just a little over a minute left. Do we have one more question? No? Well, if not, uh, oh, 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 one coming. Excellent. Thank you. That was extremely interesting. I'm in the process of setting up a national CSERT for a very small jurisdiction. Um, I'd like to just touch on your last point in your presentation about ensuring independence and avoiding the sort of political politicisation. Do you have any observations from your work about how that can best be achieved or what the threats to that might be? Yeah, you know... When I mentioned this text come from a UNGG report that was endorsed by the UN General Assembly. So, so any member, if you belong to a state that is a member of the UN, they already signed on this. Uh, how to make it work? You know, they, I mean, you can refer back to this. And whenever it comes, you know, th there are different discussions ongoing now that are actually TLP red. But, but to tell you the truth, we, if we position ourselves as being, uh, you know, as much as possible distant from the political decisions within, you know, a country or a region, that allows us to be more effective and efficient in doing our role. Uh, there is no one formula. Again, I'm happy to discuss this with you after the session, uh, but it's quite challenging and it's quite important. That's why it ended up in the UNGG report. It, they wanted to, all the world to know about this. All right, that uh, pretty much wraps up our time. I'd like to thank Sharif again. If you could give a round of applause. Thank you. Excellent presentation. And remind you, please fill in the surveys. It's very important for us. Thanks very much.